December 7, 1941, a flock of Japanese aircrafts besieged Pearl Harbor by command of Admiral Yamamoto. Every warbird belonging to the United States was ablaze and could never again be flown. This attack was impactful, but the Japanese target was the battleships. While all ships were damaged, the USS Arizona, USS Oklahoma, and the USS Utah sunk to the bottom of the harbor. 1,177 crewmen died that day. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Over a couple of months, President Roosevelt was pressured by the media to acknowledge the 120,000 Japanese Americans living in the United States. Against his morals and his wife's strong opinion, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19th of 1942 which immediately authorized the imprisonment of all Japanese Americans. President Roosevelt was not happy with the decision, considering the Japanese were not the only alleged danger during World War II. But it was a time of national crisis, and it was thought by Americans to be the only option to ensure their safety. Although the United States was afraid of another invasion, Japanese Americans should not have been thrown into internment camps, fenced in, rattled, and disheartened for years. Almost every one of the Japanese Americans were innocent. Denied due process and protection under law, over 100,000 American citizens were trapped behind barbed wires, making them victims of remarkably unfair racial profiling and unjust incarceration. Soon after the ratification of Executive Order 9066, posters dictating relocation were made public, taped on every main street in the United States. Within days, the Federal Bureau of Investigation aggressively knocked on doors to force Japanese American citizens to vacate their homes and businesses, heading to the nearest relocation center. All of their belongings were kept in storage or thrown away. They could only keep what they could carry. Approximately 17,000 children under the age of 10 were imprisoned among adults and were not favored due to age or developmental state. By the time most of the Japanese Americans were apprehended, over 100,000 were in confinement. Of those, less than 250 were convicted of spying for Japan, meaning 99% of people who were confined were innocent. After being forced out of their homes, Japanese Americans were stuck on buses and trains for days on end, heading towards their designated internment camp for monitored housing which almost never fit decent living conditions. These prisons were converted racetracks and barbed wire fences, nothing less than a nightmare. In many cases, before being assigned rooms, thousands of people slept in horse stalls or cow sheds. There always seemed to be food shortages and substandard sanitation. To make matters worse, there were crowding issues everywhere. In the provided homes, multiple families were expected to live in one room, barely enough space for a few people to live comfortably. These shelters had little to no insulation for cold weather and poor ventilation in the heat. Typhoid, dysentery, smallpox, and other diseases spread across camp with ease. Even in the dining halls, too many people were crammed at the same time. To eat, selection was minimal. Rice, vegetables, and bread just about every day. The portions were not filling and many prisoners say it was disgusting. Food poisoning and other similar illnesses resulted this. Bullets stormed down like hail from guard towers for simply getting too close to the fencing. Men and women being shot at and killed because they were stuck in a jail they had no business being in. Tear gas was thrown at crowds by police forces causing commotion and multiple reported deaths. From the start, violence and discomfort were brought upon the prisoners. The camps were completely inexcusable and someone needed to put a stop to them. In 1942, 22-year-old Fred Korematsu refused to participate in the camps. He was arrested and sent to the San Francisco County Jail. Four months later, he was convicted of defying a government order. At the time, he was only looking out for himself. He had no idea he would be the triumphant leader for the Japanese in the future. After being threatened and given more months of jail time, Korematsu stayed persistent. He appealed his case until he got to the Supreme Court. The first time around, the court ruled against him. 
His professional life was affected greatly by his conviction. However, that did not stop him from dedicating a huge amount of his time standing up for Japanese Americans. Following the end of World War II, Japanese Americans were freed from incarceration. Still, they were trapped inside the transparent fence of racism returning to American society. For years, Japanese Americans all over the nation lived uncomfortably. Not only were these citizens forced to start their lives over again, but the racial bias against them made the task of doing so much more difficult. Japanese Americans that ran successful businesses or had beautiful homes came back to nothingness. Many employers refused to hire freed men and women, leaving only the backbreaking jobs, which could not pay enough to reestablish what was once lost. Aside from physical losses, there were also post war psychological impacts. Nina Wallace explains that many SA or first generation Japanese Americans felt an internalized sense of shame having been treated like criminals, as if they had done something wrong. She also mentions how Issai's children Nisai, or second generations, struggled to understand the full ramifications of their incarceration experiences. Some struggled with powerlessness while others developed post-traumatic stress or distanced themselves from anything that had to do with Japan. America wasn't doing anything to help Japanese Americans gain back the life they had worked to achieve. Roughly 40 years later, in 1983, Korematsu's case was reopened by pro bono attorneys. After being offered a pardon by the U.S. Justice Department, an attempt to stop Korematsu from proceeding with the case, a close member of his family claimed that Fred was not interested in a pardon from the government. Instead, he always felt that it was the government who should seek a pardon from him and from Japanese Americans for the wrong that was committed. Later in the year, Korematsu's conviction was overturned. Even then, he wanted the government to admit that they were wrong. He fought for the government's word to never allow this to happen to any American citizen, no matter their race, creed, or color. He decided to continue his work as an active member of the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations, an organization that worked to prevent this form of confinement from happening again. He traveled to Washington, D.C. and helped process the official apology from the government to all the surviving Japanese Americans that were in internment. Starting in 1988, President Reagan signed a Civil Liberties Act, which compensated over 100,000 people that were incarcerated in Japanese internment camps. This was a formal apology and $20,000 to every surviving victim. Internment was now described as a grave injustice, the money acting as a redress for their experiences. When Korematsu first went to court back in the 1940s, he wanted to receive proper justice. He did not want to wait 40 years for everyone to get their apology. In the end, he got what he asked for, yet the experience of internment can never be forgotten. Nothing can ever take the awful memories from over 100,000 people. Imagine living for over two years, staring at a barbed wire fence, freedom right past the pricks and wire. Trying to get past it, however, would just be digging your own grave. Thankfully, the American government promised to never again make internment camps for citizens and use them with the reasoning of race. For many years, the resolution stood triumphant. If only that promise was held to this day and was not being questioned once again. With new events going on, decisions need to be made. Sadly, some officials are ignoring the outcome of the Korematsu v. United States case. Internment is comparable to some aspects of the Holocaust, which went on at the same time. Today, plans for the Muslim immigration ban can be compared to the Japanese American tragedy. In March of 2019, thousands of Japanese internment survivors and their descendants began protesting immigrant detention centers held in the United States, which are nearly identical to Japanese incarceration centers. Protesters repeat the message, not okay then, not okay now. That there are people on the outside who care, uh, people like Japanese Americans who understand what mass incarceration could mean, Satsuki Ina, one of the organizers of the protest, describes it as their duty, saying, Americans turned their backs on us as we disappeared. Nobody marched for us, nobody protested, but today we bring our voices, our drums, and our Suru spirit to speak out against unjust mass incarceration. We've all heard the phrase, history tends to repeat itself. While all these examples exist for different reasons and are carried out in various ways, the common theme in all of them are stereotypical behaviors based on ethnicity. The tragedy of racial and religious discrimination in the United States has been proven to be ongoing, no matter the extents we go to end it.